Come on, all over the building, all over the building. Come on, sing it one good time. I'm calling sick. All over, all over, all over, all over, all over. If that's you, if that's you. If that's you who needs the blessing. If that's you who needs the prayer answer. If that's you needing God to make a way. Don't let nobody sing it to you. But if you're the one standing in need, come on and just sing it for yourself. Sing it from your soul. Sing it from your heart. I'm calling. I'm calling. Savior. Savior. I know you can hear them, but Lord, hear me. Hear me. I'm not as loud as them, God. I'm not as vocal as them. I'm not as popular as them. But God, while on others, you're calling. While on others, you're showing up for. God, while for somebody else, you're passing out blessings. Here am I, Lord. 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 I'm calling. I'm calling. I'm calling. Savior. It's me, it's me, it's me. Savior. It's me again, Lord. Hear me, God. Hear me, God. Show up for me, God. While on others, while on others, while on others. While on others, don't pass me, don't pass me, don't pass me, don't pass me. Come on, one more time, one more time, one more time. I'm calling While on others, while on others. While on others, I walk. Do not pass me by. Do not pass me by. Oh God, who hears and answers. Oh God, who knows. Even when we don't have the words, you understand the groans and the moans. You read the message in the tears. You understand our speech even in silence. Thank you for being a showing up God, a supplying God, a strengthening God, a staying up God, a spirit filling God. Thank you for being our everything. And even in this moment, just be God as we give you praise, as we give you glory, God, and as we give you the honor. Show up in the here and in the now. And speak to us from your scriptures. Supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And all the people of God did say amen and amen and amen again. Come on and give God a good hand praise in the place. I want to invite your attention this morning to a familiar passage of scripture in the gospel 
according to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, beginning reading at verse number 17. Amen. Luke chapter 5, beginning at verse number 17. When you have it, say amen. If you need more time, say, Lord, help my Wi-Fi. <laughs> amen. Because most of us are using apps that go a little slower sometimes. Amen. Luke chapter 5. I want to begin reading at verse number 17, uh, perhaps down through verse 25, but I may stop reading before that. Hear ye the word of the Lord. Now it happened on a certain day as Jesus was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Samaria, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, men on a, brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. When they could not find a way how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, Man, your sins are forgiven. I'm fascinated by, by this, this part of verse 18 said the men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed whom they sought to bring in and lay before Jesus men brought in on a bed a man who was paralyzed whom they wanted to lay before Jesus I want to tag that part of the text and share from this thought sometimes you need a little help amen you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Sometimes you need a little help. We live in a culture and a country that celebrates independence. We are told that in order to succeed or be happy in life, all you got to do is be independent because all you need is yourself. That's why single sisters increasingly say things like, I don't need a man, I just need myself. Brothers are now saying things like, I don't need a woman, all I need is myself. People say things like, I don't need friends, all I need is myself. That's why students say things like, I don't need teachers, I can go online and teach myself. When we get sick, we don't even go to doctors as quickly as we used to. We just get online and Google the symptoms and self-diagnose ourselves. When we go shopping, we don't need cashiers because now everybody got self-checkout lines and we can get in the line and help ourselves. Although recently Walmart is bringing cashiers back because some of y'all helped yourself a little too much, amen, and they were losing money. But we live in a country and a culture that emphasizes independence. We say that people slow you down. We say people can get in your way. We claim people can impede your progress. People are jealous of you and do whatever they can just to stop you. So in this new era, this postmodern era, we have come to devalue meaningful personal relationships and emphasize independence. But no matter how hard you try my friends there are just some things you can't do by yourself hello no matter how hard you try you cannot make it to life in life or through life by yourself you missed it no matter how hard you try you cannot make it to life by yourself you can't make a baby by yourself huh you cannot turn a house into a home by yourself you you cannot have a conversation conversation by yourself. If you do, I got a reference for you. You cannot party by yourself. If you do, you need some help. You cannot be in a community by yourself and you cannot experience love by yourself. 
Because God did not create us to be independent. God created us to be interdependent. Interdependent means I need you and you need me. God made us to be interdependent. That's why when God made man, God said it's not good for this brother to be by himself. I'm going to make a woman to be his companion. Oftentimes we limit the application of that text to its marital relationship but please don't miss the fact that when God made woman God made woman complete and whole in and of herself and God made man complete in and of whole by himself God made man and woman to be biological theological and sociological equals and God gave the unique gift of success in society to the way they related to one another. Don't let me get lost. So when men exclude women or women exclude men, the Bible suggests we are cutting off half the blessings of our lives. Because music would be monotone if males were the only ones allowed to sing it. Food would be bland and 99% of the population would starve to death if only men were able to cook it. The world would be an ugly place if you depended on men to decorate it. And only half of the gospel could be preached if only men were allowed to preach it. The Godfather James Brown tried to tell us generations ago that it's a man world but it wouldn't be nothing without a woman or a girl in it. The point that I'm trying to make is that from the beginning of time, God did not create us to be independent. God created us to be interdependent. That men need women, women need men, and we both need each other. I'll help you and you help me. I'll pray for you and you pray for me. I got your back if you got my back because God created us to be interdependent. And even when it comes to connecting with God himself, it's not always something you can do by yourself. You don't believe me? Jarius' daughter was on her deathbed and she could not get to Jesus by herself. So her daddy had to do it on her behalf. When Lazarus was sick, he could not get to Jesus by himself. So his sisters Mary and Martha sent the messenger to go to Jesus on his behalf. When John the Baptist was in jail, he could not go meet Jesus and ask for himself. So he sent messengers to ask, are you the one or shall we look for another? And yet here you are fooling yourself into thinking you are independent. Here you are fooling yourself thinking that you don't need anybody. But what about when you are toe up from the flow up and you you can't get up. What about when you've been let down, been broken down, and life has you on lockdown? Because that's the dilemma of the man whom we meet in today's text. For the text says, one day as Jesus was sitting in a house teaching that a crowd of Pharisees and teachers of the law came from Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem to hear him teach and to ask him questions. But as Jesus was talking with them there was another man who needed his attention but the man was paralyzed and he could not walk he was bedridden and he could not drive he was he, he was on the sick and shut in list so he could not stand at the bus stop and wait for tr public transportation nothing about the man's condition allowed him to lie to himself and pretend he was was independent. He knew he needed somebody. He knew that he needed help. He knew that he needed other people to help him to get to where he was trying to be. And if we are honest with ourselves, many of us are just like the man that sometimes we too need a little help. 
And this, beloved, is when the real stars of the story begin to emerge because the stars of the story are not the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who are in the house. Nope, the stars of the story is not even the paralyzed man who is lying on a sick bed. Nope, the star of the story is not even Jesus whom everybody else in the story has come to see. Nope. But the stars of the story are the men who bring the paralyzed man to Jesus. Broken and on his bed, they bring the paralyzed man to Jesus. And when they can't get the crippled man through the crowd, they climb the wall and tear off the roof and lower the paralyzed man to be in the presence of Jesus. And I hear the text trying to teach us something today. The text is trying to teach us that sometimes when you are trying to connect with God through Christ, Christ, that sometimes you need some thugs to help you along the way. I know you like all of your friends to be edumacated, but sometimes you need some thugs to help you along the way. I know you like for all the folk in your crowd to come from two-parent homes and have a two-parent household, but sometimes you need some thugs to help you get to the place where you need to be because that that's who these men are, who are the real stars of the story, the men who bring the paralyzed man to Jesus. They are thugs because thugs don't take no for an answer. That's how I know because thugs tear up other people's property just to get to where they want to be. That's how I know because thugs don't care about you being busy. They demand your attention. That's how I know. No, because thugs stick together and won't let anything or anybody stop them from reaching their goal. And that's what these men are acting like in the text. The stars of the story when they go to a stranger's house and commit vandalism by tearing the roof off the house just to help their friend get to Jesus. They are acting like thugs theological thugs if you will but thugs nonetheless and what makes them theological thugs is that they were doing what they were doing in order to get their paralyzed partner into the presence of Jesus by definition theology is the study of God a theologian is one who studies God and thugs who are the stars of the story have studied God enough and know something about him. They know that he has power. They know that he is a healer. They've heard what he has done before and believe he can do it again. They know that if anybody could help their paralyzed partner, it was God. And when their theology mixed with their thuggishness, they made some things happen because theological thugs will do whatever they got to do to get God's attention. Theological thugs don't care about being bougie. They're just trying to get a blessing. Theological thugs don't care how far they have to go or how long it will take. They're not going to let anything or anybody stop them from getting to Jesus. Theological thugs don't care about the order of service. They're just trying to overcome. They don't care about the carpet or the pew. They just want to give God praise. They, they don't care about whether or not it's their turn. They are turned church out, turning up for Jesus. And theological thugs don't just get you part of the way, but they'll roll with you all of the way. And as I look at my own life and my own journey with Jesus, I thank God for some thugs who study theology who helped me to get to Jesus. 
And I just came to tell somebody who needs to have an audience with the Lord that sometimes you need a little help. And when you need some help to get God's attention, you need some thugs who will do whatever they got to do to help you get to where you need to be. And look at what the text is telling us today about when you need some help. The text is telling us that when you need some help, you cannot discriminate against the delivery service. I, I'm in the text. I'm in the text. I'm in the text because somebody needs some help. When you need help, you cannot discriminate against the delivery service because I hear the partners, the brothers moving the man in the text. It's going to be a bumpy ride. You can't be too delicate or too sensitive because thugs aren't known for being delicate or for being sensitive. They just know how to get the job done by any means necessary. They gonna be some turbulence along the way. You gonna meet, make some people mad along the way. They might tear up some stuff along the way, but you can't discriminate against the delivery service when you need some help. And if we can be honest with our own selves on today, some of us have not reached the place of deliverance because of our own spirit of discrimination. We don't like the people whom God has sent to help deliver us. We don't like the man whom God has sent to deliver us. We don't like the woman of God because we believe that women ought not be preachers. We discriminate against people because we think they're too young to work in God's deliverance business or they're too old to work in the deliverance ministry or they're too dumb to work in the deliverance ministry. We discriminate against people because we think they don't have the right skin color or the right background or the right temperament to be whom God is sending to help us. But I'm telling you today that when you cannot get to God by yourself and when you realize you need some help along the way, you cannot discriminate against the people who show up trying to help you. That's a lesson we need to learn also in this election season because in many ways we find ourselves divided among lines in this country. We're divided Democrat, Republican, and Independent. We are divided black and white, divided Asian and Hispanic, divided immigrant and, and citizen. We are divided working class and middle class. We are divided gay, lesbian being straight, bisexual, or transgendered. We are divided country versus urban. We are divided north side versus south side, east side against west side. We are divided urban and suburban. But I'm here to tell you that elections teach us time and time again that none of us can do it by ourselves. I know you may have a favorite candidate that you hope gets in but they can't make it by themselves. And sooner or later, we got to realize that it's not about the lines that divide us. It's about the purpose that unites us. Because if the purpose that unites us is greater than the lines that divide us, then I don't care about your territory. I don't care about your label. I don't care about your pronouns. I don't care about the side of town you come from. I don't care how you normally vote or who you normally vote for. All I care about is can we work on this thing to get where we need to go together. Listen, you don't have to have a PhD to work with me. All you need is some consistency. You don't have to have a bag just to work with me. All you got to know is that you want to be blessed. You don't have to have everything together for us to work together. All we got to understand is that together everybody accomplishes more. And that's why I'm so glad about the theological 
theological thugs we meet in the text because in the text we see some men who are thugs that have reputations, thugs who are known for being aggressive, thugs who are known for tearing stuff up, thugs who are known for making people uncomfortable, thugs who don't care about other people's property. They just show up to make some noise in the presence of the Lord. And some of us would have never rolled up with the thugs in the text because we would have said it don't take all of that. Some of us would have missed out on our blessing if we were in the text because we would have said climbing walls and tearing off roofs, it don't take all of that. Some of us would have missed the miracle in the text because we would have been saying that shouting and crying and being loud, it don't take all that. Now, here you are broke and bedridden and here you are in a crisis and can't get out here you are broke busted and disgusted and you gonna miss your blessing because you discriminate against the people who know how to get to God because you say it don't take all of that here you are trying to be prim and proper here you are trying to act uppity and sedity here you are acting like you too good to give God praise. Here you are thinking you're too good to turn up and talk about the goodness of God. Here you are thinking you got to be cool, calm, and collected, and yet you go home with the same crisis that you came in with. But instead of thinking you too good for them, or instead of thinking you don't need them, instead of saying you don't want to get close to them, the text says you better stop discriminating against God's deliverance service. But then the second thing the text is telling us today is that is that is that when you sometimes you need help, so you got to put other people's faith above your fears. Sounds strange, but I know I'm right about it. Sometimes when you need help, you have to put other people's faith above your own fears. I'm in the text still. I'm in the text. I'm in the text still. I'm still in the text because, because while the text doesn't say this specifically, in my mind, the paralyzed man was probably afraid to go with these thugs in the first place. They had to carry him over a rocky road. His bed likely wasn't level because in my mind, the men weren't the same height and their arms weren't the same length. Yeah, in my mind, the man was telling them to just turn around and take me back home. And then when they got to the house and saw the crowd, they saw they set his bed on the ground while they went and looked for a way to get in the house, in my mind. And the whole time the man is probably laying on the ground being bitten by insects, being bumped into by people standing in the crowd. And when they came back, they said to the man, well, we can't get in through the front door. An another man came and said, well, we can't get in through the back door. A third man came back and said, we, we can't get you in through the window either. But a fourth man came and said, guess what? I found some rope. And I think we can get them through the roof. Understand, can you imagine already being paralyzed, already being bedridden, already feeling dirty and defeated? Now somebody says they want to use a raggedy rope to pull you up the side of the house and then use that same raggedy rope to let you down on the inside of a house so that you can get to Jesus. How are we going to do it? We're going to tear off the roof of this house whose owner we don't know just to get you to do. These men must be crazy. These men must have lost their mind. These men are going to get arrested and get me killed. But when you can't get there by yourself, sometimes, my friends, you've got to trust other people's faith more than you trust your fears. You've got to stay calm through the chaos and the commotion. You've got to stay strong through the suspense. You've got to stay at peace during the process because the text says that as they were lowering the paralyzed man through the roof into the midst of the room that Jesus looked up and saw them. And the Bible says that when he saw their faith, somebody says their faith. 
When he saw their faith, Jesus was teaching, but he stopped teaching when he looked up and saw their faith. The house was packed with people, but Jesus ignored all the people in the house when he looked up and saw their faith. There was a man who was on the mat who was hanging at the end of the rope, but Jesus even looked past the man in the midst. He looked up and saw their faith. And when Jesus saw their faith, he looked back at the man on the mat who was hanging in the midst at the end of the rope and said, man, your sins are forgiven. When he saw their faith, he gave the paralyzed man what he needed and he didn't even have to ask for it. It reminds me, y'all, of how I came to y'all 18 years ago because I didn't want to move to Dallas. I was afraid. I had a good job with benefits and I was afraid to quit. I was pastoring a promising church and I was afraid to leave. I didn't know anybody here in Dallas and I was afraid to come here by myself. But when I told my mama about all of my fears, when I told my mama how I didn't want to go, when I told my mama I was afraid of one, two, three in ABC, my mama looked at me and said, son, you you gotta go anyway. She heard my fears and said go anyway. And the only reason I'm here today is because I trusted my mama's faith even more than I trusted my fear. And there ought to be somebody in the house on today who can give God a praise not for your faith, but praise God for their faith. Because their faith got you to God when you couldn't get there by yourself. Their faith prayed you through your problems when you were too pitiful to pray for yourself. Their faith held on to hope when you were in the midst of a helpless situation. Their faith cried out to God for you to get you through your crisis. Their faith kept on trusting God even when you didn't believe there was a God. Their faith saw your sickness and declared that by his stripes, you are already healed. Their faith was standing for you when you were sitting down and couldn't do nothing for yourself. There ought to be somebody in the house who knows that you didn't just make it because of your faith, but you made it because of their faith. The hymn writer puts it this way, that somebody prayed for me, had me on their mind. They took the time and they prayed for me. And I'm so glad they prayed prayed. I'm so glad they prayed. I'm so glad they prayed for me. I don't know who it was for you, but my mama is the one who prayed for me. My preacher is the one who prayed for me. I'm so glad that when I couldn't do it for myself, that God sent some other folk who loved me enough to pray for me. Is there anybody up in here who knows you would not have made it if they wouldn't have prayed for you. Is there anybody up in here who knows you wouldn't have made it if they wouldn't have tore some stuff up for you? Is there anybody up in here who knows you would not be standing if they wouldn't have went down on their knees for you? Is there anybody up in here who can thank God for them, who can praise God for them, who can honor God for them because of them you made it? Texas, Texas. The text says that sometimes you need help. And when you realize that you need help, sometimes you've got to put other people's faith above your own fears. But then third and finally, the text tells us this, that not only, not only, not only do you have to put their faith above your fears, watch this, but then the text tells us third and finally that you've got to get up and praise God for yourself. I'm so glad that somebody prayed for me. But I also thank God that I got enough sense to learn how to get up and pray for myself. I thank God that some folk have helped me. But I also thank God that I learned how to get up and help myself. I thank God that somebody instructed and taught me. But I also thank God that I got enough sense to get up and learn some things for myself. For the Bible says that as Jesus spoke to the man, 
and told the man, your sins are forgiven. The text says there were some people who were already in the house. And they began to talk about Jesus and about the man. Uh, isn't it strange that sometimes it's the folk who are already in the house uh, who got the most to say about what God is doing for you? Uh, isn't it strange that sometimes it's the folks that's already in the house uh, who got the most complaints and criticism to give? Uh, and that's why I'm so glad uh, that the stars of the story are not the folk who were in the house, but the stars of the story are the men who are up there on the roof because the folk in the house began to say that Jesus was a blasphemer. The folk in the house began to say, who do you think you are to begin forgiving the sins of men on the earth? They began to say, you are not God. They began to say, look at the damn that's been done to the roof. They begin to ask who's going to pay for the roof because the insurance is not going to cover that. And after they continued all of their complaining, the Bible says that Jesus shut them up and he told the man to rise up and take up his bed and walk. Well, I began to see the text clearly a little while ago because the Bible says that when the man walked back to his own house uh, it says he walked back glorifying Jesus uh, that yeah he took up his bed uh, and as he went back to the place from whence he came uh, with every step he took he was shouting thank you uh, and I began to think that he began to praise God uh, because of what God had done for him uh, I thought that he was praising God uh, because God told him through Christ his sins were forgiven uh, I thought that he was praising God because his legs had been strengthened. I thought that he was praising God because where the men are at the beginning of the story is where this man is at the end of the story. Like them he has faith. Like them he believes that God is able. Like them he's seen what God has done before and he's praising God for what he's done right now. But then I had to go back and look at the text again and I believe in my sanctified imagination that he's not praising because his legs have been strengthened. No, no, he's not praising simply because his sins have been forgiven. No, no, he's not praising God because of what his friends did. But I believe that the man is is praising God because it was while he was still hanging in the midst that God spoke a word that turned his life around. You don't get it. I believe he is praising God because while he was still hanging at the end of a rope that Jesus spoke a word that gave him some joy. You still don't get it. He is praising God because while he was hanging in the midst of where he was and where he needed to be. Uh, while he was still hanging uh, in between a point of disbelief and belief. Uh, while he was still hanging uh, in between a prayer being made and a prayer being answered. Uh, that's when Jesus spoke a word uh, that turned his life around. Uh, you still don't get it. I believe he's praising God uh, because while he was hanging in the middle uh, that Jesus spoke a word that blessed him before he hit rock bottom. Is there anybody up in here who's ever been hanging in between? Hanging in between desperation and deliverance. Hanging in between a need and a need being supplied. Hanging in between depression and joy. Hanging in between grief and celebration. Hanging in between jobs. Hanging in 
between nights, uh, hanging in between relationships, uh, hanging in between surgeries, uh, and yet you are hanging in between uh, when God spoke a word uh, that picked you up uh, before you hit rock bottom, uh, that before you hit the bottom, uh, God said, I'll restore your strength. Uh, before you hit the bottom, uh, God said, I'll give you some joy. Before you hit the bottom, uh, God said, I still love you. Before you hit the bottom, uh, God said, I get you up. I turn you around. I place your feet on solid ground. Is there anybody up in here who knows you've been blessed in the midst, in the midst of your trouble, in the midst of your despair, in the midst of your sickness, in the midst of your sorrow, in the midst of your tears, in the midst of your bad news. I'm so glad that he did not let me hit the bottom, but he blessed me in the midst of it. Is there anybody here who was on your way down? Is there anybody up in here who was on your way to a pit of problems? Is there anybody up in here who was going into a well of worthlessness? But before you hit the bottom, didn't God bless you? Before it all fell apart, didn't God favor you? Before you lost your mind, didn't God lift you? Before you threw in the towel, didn't God start talking to you? Before you gave up, didn't he give you just what you needed? If God did it for you, somebody needs your witness. If God did it for you, somebody needs your testimony. If God had did it for you, somebody needs to hear your praise. You ought to praise God because he blessed you in the midst. You ought to praise God when you were hanging at the end of your rope. He gave you words to rejoice. You ought to praise God that when you were at the end, he brought you to a new beginning. So I hear the songwriter say, you ought to praise him, praise him, praise him for Jesus, blessed Savior. He's worthy, he is worthy, my God is worthy to be praised. the true that is the true that is the true praise point in the whole story that the stars of the story had faith to go act like thugs and tear off a roof to get their partner into the presence of God and while the paralyzed man is still hanging that's what some of us are. We're still hanging. Somebody helped us get through the blockade, but we're still hanging. Somebody brought us as far as they could bring us, but we're still hanging. Hanging between the prayer being made and the prayer being answered. We're hanging between showing up and God showing out. We're hanging by a thread in the midst of a mess. And yet, that's where Jesus speaks. So if you're hanging by a rope, hold on. If you're suspended in the midst, stay there and hold on. If you're relying on somebody to hold the rope and not let you down, just keep holding on. Because God sees you. And God will speak a word to turn 
your situation around before you hit rock bottom. Don't give up. Just keep on hanging around. Don't throw in the towel. Keep on hanging around. Don't say, pull me up and get me out of here. Just keep on hanging around. God won't let you fall. That's what makes God worthy to be praised. We were singing, pass me not. O oh, gentle Savior. And even as we were singing it, somebody had something on your heart. You find yourself hanging in the midst. You're hanging in between sin and salvation. You're hanging in between heaven and hell. You're hanging in between earthly life and eternal life. But I'm here to tell you, Jesus is speaking a word right where you are. You said, don't pass me. He said, come unto me, all ye that labor the heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Somebody else is hanging between a problem and a promise. You're hanging in between an issue and a word of encouragement. God says, I have a word for you too. Fret not thyself because of evildoers. Don't be envious when you see other folk get blessed. The same way that God has showed up for others, he'll show up for you. So I don't know who you are, but right now God is saying you're invited. You've already made it into the house and he says you're invited. You're invited to say yes. You're invited to hear the word of forgiveness. You're invited to hear and experience the word of encouragement. As we stand to our feet, you are invited to give your life to Christ. For the doors of the church are open. And if you need to connect or reconnect with God on today, maybe you caught a ride with somebody. The stars have helped you get close. Maybe you sat on just the right pew. Well, there's somebody saying that if you want to go, I'll walk with you. They brought you to the right place. They've been praying for you. They brought you to the right place. They've been praising God. They brought you to the right place. But hanging in the midst, Jesus says, come unto me. I'll give you rest. I'll restore you. I'll save you. I'll strengthen you. I will supply all of your needs. You can come, you can come, you can come, you can come today. And even as the doors are open, the altar is open, the altar is open, the altar is open. Somebody may already have salvation but just needs some strength. And you need to come and cast a care on the Lord. The altar is open if you just need to come I know I'm blessed, but I got a bird I need to bring to God. The altar is open. And the doors are open. And no matter who you are or where you are, the invitation is extended. That you can come to Jesus while there's still time.